Well, going forward as, as the governor here, I know last night I got a, a piece of information, and I think this has hit the wires today. Um, we had budget issues here. We had budget issues in the state of Texas, yep. and you did what you had to do as per the Constitution. Some people are unhappy about the cuts to education and some other right. things. But again, you had to tighten the belt. Last night you came out with a piece of information. I know that, again, it went, I think, statewide today that you sent out a letter to all of the, um, all of the offices in the state. What did the, what did the letter say? Let people here know. If it it basically is asking, the, the, we're going through what's called legislative uh, uh, LARs, our, their uh, request for their appropriations, legislative appropriation request. Uh, and this is about the time of the year that they start and they go forward with it. And I just wanted to put everybody on notice uh, that we want to take a look at our budgets, just like you do in your business. Uh, I can promise you, USAA uh, is going through, Admiral, uh, uh, you look at your budget and you prioritize what's important. You look at your money flowing in. You know, the great news for the state of Texas is that we have uh, seen increased revenues coming into the state of Texas. But I want those agencies to basically freeze their uh, budgets at the 2012-2013 uh, levels. Uh, and, and that's the fiscal, or the, um, that's the fiscal year that we're in right now. And then to look at ways to reduce 10% of their budgets uh, as we go forward with these LARs for the, uh, the 14 and 15 uh, cycle that we're going into in 2013. So, and, and it, I know that there are those, and, and there are great programs that are out there that aren't funded. That, are, that, are, that may not be funded to the level of which people would like to see them funded. I don't argue that. But I've been given the responsibility to be a, uh, a leader, working with the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker in the House and the Senate, uh, to not put this state in a position uh, that is precarious from the standpoint of our economic condition. And there are models of how not to do it. There are models of not being able to say no to special interest, even if they are good, uh, good programs. And I, again, I point to California. That state is on the verge of bankruptcy. And it's on the bank, uh, verge of bankruptcy because too many special interests have been able to control the, the budgeting process and They've got a $16 billion hole uh, that they're going to try to fill by making some reductions but raising taxes. Right. And you know what's going to happen when they raise taxes again on the smaller and smaller number of businessmen and women in that state. They're it's going to come to Texas. It's an interesting quandary because I, I, did, I worked in New York, but I worked in upstate New York. If you work in New York City, you pay a city tax. Yeah. Well, I was a television news anchor in New York, so I was, I was the evil guy who made too much money. So just because I paid 10% for living in New York. Right. So I paid my 35% or whatever it was, plus I paid 10 more percent because I was the rich guy, which I wasn't, I wasn't making that much money. Um, and, and then the sales tax was way too much, and the property tax was way too much. New York, the state of New York has lost 3.4 million people, I think, in less than a decade yeah. now. They're rushing to places like Texas. So what do you do? You take the model that we see, that, that Obama, frankly, I think is utilizing nationally right now, or you look at what Ronald Reagan did, and you reduce re regulation, you reduce taxes from 70 down to 28, and then let business keep their money, let evil rich people like me, I'm not, uh, keep my money, and then we spend it, and then we hire people, then we expand, and then we have, we have more businesses coming into a city like San Antonio. That's obviously the model that you're following here. It is. Uh, listen, we can't print money, thank God. Um, why can't we stop them from producing? Well, money? And, and let me tell you, and there's a very serious note, and it's something that I hope all of us will really pay attention to over the course of the next 90 to 120 days, is that the Federal Reserve uh, will begin a uh, third quantitative easing and print money uh, to bolster the European community mm. and to, obviously, the politics of that's not lost on people as well. So, I mean, it's a great concern to me. The absolute worst thing that could happen in this country is the Federal Reserve to go into a massive uh, printing of money, another quantitative easing as they refer to it. Uh, but this president has a, a different outlook uh, from most of us in Texas. And the, the point is, he does believe that 
uh, government needs to stimulate the economy. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many times um, we have to try this before we realize that it's, it, it's a failure. Uh, and it's, you know, Samantha and, and, and Gabby, yeah, your other, uh, your, two of your four girls, mm. they're going to inherit this monstrous debt. Uh, if you print money, it may pump up the economy for a short period of time, but there is a day of reckoning coming. And the day of reckoning is going to be inflation that we have no idea how uh, impactful in a negative way it can be. And, and you need to quit spending money, Mr. President. That's the key. You need to quit spending money. And, and one of the reasons Texas is as successful a place as it is today is because we have not gone on a spending spree. In 2003, we were faced with a $10 billion budget shortfall. And the choice was to raise taxes, Hope, and Speaker Craddock and, and uh, Governor Dewhurst and myself, we made a commitment that we were not going to raise taxes, that we would cut back on spending. And the result was an economy that really grew. It is exactly like you, you laid it out, Joe, is an economy that grew. And in two years, in 05 legislative session, when we came back in, we had an $8 billion budget surplus, if you will, uh, over and above what our, our previous budget had been. And, you know, budgets go up and down. But I will suggest to you that the men and women in Austin, Texas, who are in the leadership positions and have been uh, over the last decade, are committed to physical sanity. And that means that, yes, we have a constitutional amendment that requires us to balance our budget. Thank God our founding fathers did that. But you can also balance a budget by raising taxes. And then the business community is the one that faces the real burden. Then somebody doesn't get hired because you've had to cut back because the government has said, we want more of your money. This is not rocket science. It's, um, I'm a simple guy. If you listen to me on the radio, I try to spell things out as simply as I possibly can. If you've got $20 in your pocket right now, and there, there are a finite number of $20 bills floating around, and the government prints a million more, is your 20 still worth 20 or not? Hmm. Not even close. That's the problem with printing money and not backing it up with anything. Uh, when it comes to budgets, let's talk about, there was an outcry not too long ago. People said, get to the rainy day fund, Governor. It's raining in our classrooms. You had a really loud lobby from, from the education yeah. side. And you mentioned a moment ago, there were really good causes that were coming at you, but you had to do what you had to do. How hard was it to not touch the rainy day fund, or did you never even consider it? Well, you always consider, you look yeah. and you prioritize, and, and um, there's two issues here that I want to address. One is, we have, over the last decade, uh, supported public education in this state uh, to a substantial degree, whether it's higher ed or whether it's our K through 12. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, if you look at 98 through 299 through 2009, that decade, we funded public education five times more than what population growth was. So through the decade of the 2000, the, the funding for public education has been substantial. But the idea that when the economy turns down that you, you're going to uh, continue just to uh, keep funding at the same level doesn't make sense and we all need to, you know, whether you're a school board member or whether you're a mom and dad or whether you're a, a professional that's in our classrooms, we have to look and prioritize those spending uh, levels. And, and so that's the reason that we made the, the, the reductions in, in, the, uh, in the 2011 budgetary cycle. The rainy day fund was put in place for two reasons. One was to make sure that Texas had a savings account if and when we have major natural disasters or man-made disasters. And you think about over the last decade what's happened in this state. Katrina, Gustav, Ike, Rita, Donna. We had a space shuttle that fell out of the sky in East Texas. We had the Queen Isabella Causeway. I mean, how do you plan for those? 
You plan for them two ways. One is by having the finest emergency management team in the world. And let me tell you, Nim Kidd, your former fire chief here, is an absolute godsend to, to this state from the standpoint of overseeing that. And secondly, you have that monetary savings account to address those issues. And the second reason you have that rainy day fund is so that when you borrow money long term for transportation infrastructure projects or uh, whatever the long term uh, borrowing that the state would do, you can have the smallest interest rate, the lowest interest rate that you can have. And we've done that. We got the, uh, we got the highest uh, rating uh, that you can get. And we did it because we've got approaching now eight to nine billion dollars in that rainy day fund. So, and think about it. Here's your savings account. Just put it in your personal um, life a moment. You have X numbers of dollars in your savings account. And for whatever reason, yeah, for whatever reason, you have ongoing expenses. And if you start going into your rainy day fund to pay for ongoing expenses, one day you're going to wake up and this is going to be gone and these expenditures are still going to be out there. And this is going to be zero. Don't, if we have big events. And we do here. Natural disasters of, I mean, the drought, the fires last year. It's not when, or it's not if, it's when we're going to have the next big hurricane. And we'll have a cushion against that. Well, was it also a matter, Governor, that if you gave to education or Joe Pag's fund, whatever, everybody would want some of it then? Well, you gave it to them, right. you got to give it to us now. Well, I mean, that's just the, the fact is, it's defined. This is for this. Right. That is the, uh, the you know, that's human nature, what you yeah. just explained. And, and, and look, we come to Austin, Texas, we have this discussion every year, and it, it's a, a great discussion to have. Uh, we fight like cats and dogs. Sometimes it looks a little unsavory, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have men and women, and I've been blessed. I've, I, I share with people as we go into this uh, uh, United States Senate race that uh, I've worked with David, and, and, and uh, David is a committed fiscal conservative. We've worked on uh, creating a, um, this tort reform in 2003 that has paid huge dividends. Jeff, you, you were there and engaged with it and involved with it, and, and uh, to pass the uh, tort reform that we passed, to pass those budgets without raising taxes, to pass lose or pay, uh, that's serious fiscal uh, conservatism at work. And, and I'm proud to have been partners with, with Craddock and Strauss and, and, and Dewhurst over the course of the last uh, 10 years as, as we've created the absolute most dynamic economy in America. I'll, you know, we prob I probably can't get the governor of Oklahoma to admit today, in particular, that they'd like to be a Texan. <laughs> but I'll guarantee you one thing, Mary Fallon would say that she would love to have the economy uh, of what Texas has going for it. 64 months of uh, unemployment uh, less than the national average. Uh, leading the nation in the, in, in the creation of, of jobs over the last decade. Uh, having CEO Magazine for the eighth year in a row to pick this state as the best state in the nation to do business. For the tenth year in a row, the number one exporting state. Forty-nine other governors would dearly love to be able to, to stand up and say, this is what we have created. And it didn't happen by accident. It happened because there were men and women in Austin, Texas who understood their role. And the role was to create a tax and a regulatory and a legal environment where you, the real engine of this state, could feel comfortable you could risk your capital and have a return on the investment. We got out of the way. That's government's role. God to wish that they would do it in Washington, D.C. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Governor. Joe, I think we're, we're about out of time. What a fantastic way to end this conversation with the governor, and that is to highlight the fact that this is the place to be, Governor. Your leadership, 
and those of your colleagues in the legislature have made it happen, and this business community is behind you to continue to make it happen. So thank you all. It's another round of applause for Governor Perry and Joe Pag. Well done. Thanks so much. Appreciate Way it. to go. Yes, sir. Thank you. Jim, you want to join us up here, Jim? Thank you, thank you, thank you. How you been? Good to see you.